come and gather. For this Lent, we have been inviting people to reflect on and think about the last words of Jesus. Now, if you really know the last words of Jesus, you know <laughs> that there are seven last words and there are five Sundays in Lent. So we had to really choose. But today we find ourselves on the fifth word, reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 19, verse 28. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. I am thirsty. Today I'd like to use the sermonic theme of the juxtaposition of anger. The juxtaposition of anger. Around 1825, Araminta Ross was the fifth of nine kids born in Dorchester County, Maryland. She remembers life as a child was hard. She was hired out to different homes. At the age of five, she was sent to care for a baby. And if that baby cried at night or woke up the family during the night, she would be whipped severely. At the age of eight, she remembered taking a lump of sugar, which she had never tasted. And when her mistress found out, she hid for three days among the pigs for she was so afraid of what the consequences would be for her having taken that sugar. One day she was in the grocery store and she spotted a fugitive slave. His overseer was about to confront him when she stepped in between them. The overseer, at just about the time she stepped in, was picking up a heavy metal and threw it. And it pierced her skin and she bled and fainted. It took months for her to recover and she still has sleeping spells and vivid dreams. Minty, her nickname, described childhood as one of neglect. Both of Minty's parents had been promised freedom. Her father was freed at 45. For her mother, the promise that when she turned 45, she would be freed. She even had the papers, but her owner's mother did not. She had held this promise for year after year. During slavery, the status of a child was tied to their mother. So if their mother was a slave, then all the kids born were slaves as well. But Minty's mom had held on to this promise that one day she would be free. In fact, one of the premiums in slavery was the hope that one could one day be free. And now that hope had been ripped from Minty's mom. Not only were they not going to be free, but when her mom confronted her master, they were adamant and obnoxious in their response to her mom. Our mentor was angry, and we know we can do some really out there things when we're angry. And so she prayed a prayer that God would kill her master. And the next day, her master died. Anger is one powerful emotion. And often, we don't know what to do with it. The epistles talk about being slow to get to that state of consciousness because it cuts off oxygen to the brain. And it can lead to some drastic and sometimes regrettable decisions but we never really fully embrace the positive side of anger. Anger is a powerful indicator that something is grossly wrong in our world. Anger lets us know that a violation has occurred. Anger lets us know when someone is stepping on our toes. Anger is the indicator to our nervous system that something unexpected is happening to us. Anger is there to alert us Anger is a fundamental sign that our virtues and our values are being ignored, trampled upon, and disregarded. When someone gives us our, their word, and we hold that word day in and day out and for seasons and years, and then we go to cash in and they deny it, anger comes upon our doorstep. Anger is a universal emotion 
which means every one of us has felt it at some time. Interestingly enough, I introduced this scenario on Facebook page of somebody loaning money to a friend. And then when it was time to pay that money back, the person said they didn't have it. But at the same time, the person accidentally made a mistake and sent more than the money to the person through Zelle. The question to those that were reading this post on Facebook is, what would you do? It was interesting how angry people got, how much it triggered memories. Many people said, I wouldn't give anything back. I'd keep it all. There were a few people that were a little bit more compassionate, but clearly people had felt this sense of anger that somehow their goodness had been taken granted of. This is where we enter the biblical text today. Jesus confesses, I thirst. Most of us can imagine or feel the familiar of water, feeling like we need some water, especially if you've eaten Chinese food. Sorry, y'all, that soy sauce gets you feeling really thirsty. We can relate to having a thirst in the middle of summer or after a workout. We can relate to this sense that I thirst. But by the time Jesus utters these words, hanging there for a number of hours, constant exposure to outdoor weather, miserably mocked, brutally beaten, tragically betrayed, and is theologically speaking, carrying the weight of the sins, scars, and struggles of the entire human family on his proverbial shoulders, he had reached a tipping point. All of these circumstances coupled with massive blood loss and intense hydration caused Jesus of Nazareth to cry out, I thirst. It's the shortest of all his words, but despite its brevity, this shout from the cross lets us know that Jesus is fed up. He expresses his need, longing, and vulnerability. Grandmaster Flash described it, Jesus' emotional space in this way. Don't push me because I'm close to the edge. I'm trying not to lose my head. This is not the Jesus we often relate to on Sunday mornings, but here we see him in his humanity. There's a certain kind of anger that knocks on your door when you begin to thirst for unrighteousness that pervades the worlds we live in today. Jesus got angry. It's on record. One day he was coming to the temple and he saw the capitalism of their day and he got triggered into a holy, sanctified, indignant, righteous anger. Sometimes you can know someone is angry by the tone of their voice, their actions. I don't know what goes on in your household, but in our household, you can tell when someone is angry. We are effective communicators of anger. And so was Jesus. He started talking and moving, but it wasn't what he said, it was what he did. He began to turn over tables and letting the folks know they got to get out. Jesus was angry. He was tired of giving his all. He was tired of working with folks that didn't get it. He was tired of giving his all and waiting on seeds to grow. He was tired of always having to look over his shoulder, tired of the establishment trying to write a different narrative and set him up. He's the one that walked on water, gave sight to the blind, and set the captives free, and now finds himself thirsty his pain and his agony heavily hanging on the cross, and Jesus had a moment. So what are you going to do with this anger? Because all of us feel it. All of us get angry. This week, supporting my son and his own homeschooling experience, we were reading this story about nuclear waste. And honestly, I remembered that there was nuclear waste and that it was being stored somewhere, but I sort of kind of forgot about it. But I was reading this article, or he was reading this article, and I was listening about nuclear waste being stored. Do you know that in our country, the United States of America, there are 80 sites that hold a whole lot of nuclear waste? It takes a piece of paper one month to decompose. 
It takes an apple core six months to decay. It takes a plastic cup 50 years to decay, but nuclear waste, nuclear waste, it takes millions of years to decompose. And I began to think of our anger like nuclear waste. It's a powerful emotion, and how we handle it makes all the difference in the world. And if not handled correctly, it's dangerous. It's not only dangerous to ourselves, but it's dangerous to those in proximity to us. You've heard the word toxic people. As long as there's space between our present and our possibility, we should be using our anger to advocate for those who cannot advocate for themselves. As long as there's space between our dream and our destiny, we have to allow our anger to ignite our cause. As long as there's a disconnect between our reach and our reality, we have work to do. As long as there's a cool space distance between our brothers and our sisters, we have some work to do. Our anger is the Holy Spirit nudging us to get up off of our blessed assurance and reach out and reach back. And there are so many good organizations doing great work. We can find our tribe. You could also join Sharing God's Love here at our church that does work on the outside of our church. Candy Leitner, I don't know if you recognize her name, but she's a mom. And that's the thing she takes most seriously. A drunk driver crashed into her car with her 18-month-old child, injuring her daughter. Her daughter recovered. Six years later, an impaired driver ran over her son, Travis. He had many broken bones and other injuries and was in a coma and had permanent brain damage. The driver who injured him was impaired when he ran over. That driver also had no license to be on the road, and that driver got no ticket. But on May 3rd, 1980, Candy Leitner would participate, no, Can Candy Leitner would have another experience that would change her life forever. Her 13-year-old daughter, Carrie, was walking in the neighborhood on her way to a Christian carnival. A drunken driver struck her daughter from behind. He briefly passed out, came to and drove off after having killed her daughter three times. The crash threw her daughter's body 125 feet in the air. Her body was so badly mutilated, they could not use her organs for anything donatable. A repeat drunken driver offender committed the crime. He was free on bail for a hit and run drunken drive crash only two days earlier. Killing her daughter was the fifth offense in four years. And do you know what Candy Leitner felt? She felt anger. That's right, anger. Anger is that universal emotion that lets us know something is wrong. Something is wrong. Four days after the death of her daughter, she started mad. And mad is just another word for anger. But mad is also the acronym for Mothers Against Drunk Drivers. She said over her daughter's body, I will not let your death be in vain. Candy Leitner took her anger and she used it for something purposeful, to advocate for legislation, to work to bring more awareness to drunk driving. She kept her promise. As followers of Christ, it is okay for us to be angry. It is our birthright. The things that are happening in our world, I wonder about you if you didn't get angry about them. Systems exist that keep their foot on people's necks. Our world prizes things over people. And if there's any love of God in us at all, it should make us angry what is happening around us. But not just toxic anger. 
We need anger that helps to point our feet in the right direction. Anger that sits by idly does become toxic, but anger that's guided with prayer can be the way that leads to forming organizations such as MAD. Anger that leads us to join with others that are fighting similar causes. Anger that leads to strategic action. I was just in an LSC meeting and I can't believe it. There were people in there that were strategic about their cause and they won. Anger that causes us to do something because nothing is not an option. Anger has fueled so many movements. Anger has necessitated change in corrupt systems. Anger has tackled corrupt systems and turns over tables and says, not in my midst, get out. Don't let go of your anger, but appropriate it so it doesn't di get dispensed in such a way that is toxic. Let us, during this Lent, recommit ourselves to using our anger as our voice, as our power, to stand by people Jesus would have stood by and to support and fight and advocate for change. Today, I began with the humble beginnings of Armenta and her family. This story continues to get worse. Her master was selling slaves, and she got a win that she was going to be sold. Armenta made a decision, angry and all. She decided to run away. Now, her and her brothers were going to make this run, but the consequences of getting caught were enough to scare most people from leaving ever in the first place at all. And so they, before they could ever get far, her two brothers turned back. But our mentor said, I got to go. And though those around her said, it's foolish for a girl with a head injury who faints spontaneously to run, you are definitely going to get caught. The odds were against Minty. But Minty determined in her mind, and she made it to freedom. Now, you might think the story ends here, but after she worked a year and taste freedom, Minty decided with her anger that she needed to go back and help others, that if she could be free, that others deserved to be free too. She went back several times, and by now you may recognize that I'm talking about Harriet Tubman. Maybe you didn't. Her real name was Armenta, and later she named herself after her mother. Her mother's name was Harriet, and she decided to use her mother's name. And so people said she made several trips back to the South to rescue people. And she even rescued people in Civil War. And she kept doing it. You see, Armenta used her anger to do something constructively. There's nothing wrong with anger. Oftentimes we have felt afraid of it. It seems taboo. And Christians got a bad case of being nice and suppressing their anger. But anger suppressed is toxic, and maybe that's you. But anger that's dealt with, anger that's used to guide you in a way that's constructive can be powerful and can be mighty. The last words of Harriet, since we're talking about last words, is I go to prepare a place for you. Often this song was sung and it referred to Harriet, go down Moses, way down Egypt land, tell old Pharaoh to let my people go. In the spirit of Lent and the spirit of Women's History Month and in the spirit of Black History Month, I say let your anger fuel your journey and tell the oppressive forces to let our people go. Amen. <laughs>